Hello viewers, it's Josie. Welcome back to Eclectic Movie Reviews. And it's a couple days till Valentine's Day. And with that in mind, I decided to give my annual romance recommendation video tradition. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about 10 movies, 10 romance movies and um, uh, um, all, I'm, I'm not putting it in order of ranking. It's alphabetical, as most of my lists typically are. Bear with me here. I'm going to be sipping tea while doing this video, so um, uh, please excuse. Okay, so let me just get right into it. The first film I'm going to talk about is The Americanization of Emily um, from 1964, directed by Arthur Hiller, screenplay by Patty Chayefsky. It's based on a novel. I forget the, uh, I, I believe. Yeah, it's based on a novel. I don't remember the name of the author, though. Okay, so the setting is 1994 during the Second World War. Charlie Mason, played by James Garner, is a lieutenant commander. Melvin Douglas plays his superior, Rear Admiral William Jessup. Charlie meets and falls in love with a recently widowed British motor pool driver named Emily, played by Julie Andrews. Not only did her husband die in the war, but also her father and brother. She, pre she appreciates his laid-back laid personality. Jessup assigns Charlie to die in victorious honor. And Emily is both intrigued and turned off by Charlie's eagerness, if you will, to be an American hero. On the other hand, she values his intention to be a good man, but on the other hand, she doesn't want him to pointlessly die in vain. The film scathingly critiques superficial American ideas of heroism while also being hopeful. So the story presents that we can be heroes in our day-to-day -day lives just by loving and not shooting guns and blowing up stuff. Americanization of Emily would make an excellent double feature with Preston Sturge's Hail the Conquering Hero because they both satirize vain ideas of war heroism, all being love stories at the center. He was nominated for two Oscars, Best Black and White Cinematography and Best Art Sec Decoration, Black and White. Um, I would have nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. The writing here by Patty Chayefsky is, is sharply witty and emotionally resonant. You know, this was released the same year as Mary Poppins. Julie Andrews, of course, won the Oscar for that, and Julie Andrews' performance here is equally challenging and worth recognition as her performance in Mary Poppins. Overall, this movie is a very underrated gem. So that's uh, Americanization of Emily. Um, as far as its availability... I know that it's um that it's on DVD. I don't know about Blu-ray, but I I got it from a library in, library interloan. Moving forward, it, next film we're going to talk about is Bebe's Kids from 1992, directed by Bruce W. Smith, who was um I think the showrunner for The Proud Family on Disney Channel back in the day. So. This was inspired by a stand-up routine by Robert, Robin Harris, who co-wrote the screenplay with Reginald Hudlin. Um, the main character in the movie is named after him. Uh, it's not really based on a true story. Rather, the setup for the story and the character names were taken from the stand-up joke, if that makes sense. After the film begins with a short snippet of that stand-up, we see Robin at a bar telling the bartender and other patrons about everything that happened, it's circular framing, if you will. At his boss's funeral, Robin meets a sexy woman named Jamika. She drives him home, and he's already pursuing her. Jamika picks up her son named Leon, and Robin is introduced to him, of course, and Jamika asks Robin if he would like to accompany her and Leon to the amusement park fun world, and Robin says yes. And what Robin doesn't know yet, however, is that they're not the only ones going on this trip to Fun World. In fact, Jamika has a friend named Bebe, who's an absentee mother, and she often watches, uh, 
uh, Jamika often watches her three rowdy kids, LaShawn, Khalil, and Pee Wee. And Pee Wee, although he's a baby, has like the deepest voice of them all. And these kids come along for the ride, adding, as you guessed it, mischief. All sorts of crazy stuff happens at Fun World. There are rap musical numbers. The kids are chased by government agents that look like Agent Smiths from The Matrix. And this predated The Matrix by seven years. Not to mention that they break a mock Titanic ship. And this was five years before Titanic was even released. And, and then Robin's ex-wife happens to be the park at the park, making things more awkward. This movie's a blast from start to finish. It's outlandishly ridiculous, but it also has heart. And uh, if you like, like, family, like, vacation adjacent kind of movies, I think you'd really dig this. I know that the new Beverly was doing a double feature with this and, um, and a Goofy movie, I believe, this month. Or it was previous month. Uh, I forget, but... But it's a good one. Uh, Bay Base Kids available is available to watch on Paramount Plus and Pluto TV. Next up is a film that I recently watched on Friday Friday afternoon, and that's Dogfight from 1991, directed by Nancy Savoca, and um, someone else wrote the screenplay, but I forget his name. Should have written his name down, but um. The setting is San Francisco during the Vietnam War era, November 21st, 1963. Eddie Birdlace, played by River Phoenix, is a young Marine. He and his buddies are about to go to Vietnam. They arrange a game in which they refer they which they refer to as a dogfight. And this game entails each guy betting $50 finding the ugliest date possible, and the one with the ugliest girl at his side wins. Eddie meets a girl at a coffee shop named Rose. She's on her break playing a guitar. That's their meet cute um, for um, uh, I, that that's uh, that's when we first see them together uh, on screen. Rose is not ugly per se, but what she's what some might consider to be plain. I think Lily Taylor is naturally beautiful, to be honest, but just not like in this for this movie by typical media and post standards eddie offers to take her out with his buddies rose is a bit weary but she falls through anyway then rose realizes what the initial intention behind the date was so she is obviously upset rightfully so what makes this a tough situation is that not only did rose genuinely start liking eddie but eddie genuinely started liking rose as well they then they continue hanging out throughout the night and this is a sweet romance with two excellently naturalistic performances at the center of it by River Phoenix and Lily Taylor. The story also has interesting things to say about gender dynamics, particularly the vain false ideal of dominance among male-on-male -male competition. That's kind of like what Americanization of Emily talks about a bit. And uh, there's a scene where Rose asks Eddie why he chose to take part in the competition. To which Eddie replies that he wanted to get back at people. And Rose replies, what good does that do? And uh, it, it, what good is that? And uh, I would consider Dogfight to be just as much of an anti- a war film as the Americanization of Emily. And the character of Rose is, I like to consider to be the antithesis to false ideas of toxic masculinity presented to Eddie by his Marine friends and the push to go to war. In other words, gentleness, empathy, and a more humanistic approach to life, if you will. Dogfight was recently added to the Criterion Collection, deservedly so. And I watched it on DVD through an interlibrary loan, not yet you know, on the Criterion, but you know, I still enjoyed it for the story. So yeah, that's Dogfight, uh, a big recommendation. Next up is The Green Green Grass of Home from 1982, directed by Hu Hsiao Hsien. I could be mispronouncing his name, 
but he directed The Assassin and three times. He's a prolific um, Chinese, a dr- Thai, I think he's Thai, I know, I know he's from Taiwan, director. Um, so a young man named Gan Yan Lu is from, is new from Taipei uh, to rural Taiwan. He gets a job as a substitute school teacher. He and one of the fellow teachers, Su Yun, fall in love. And the students are an interesting bunch. The story is told through a series of coming-of-age vignettes with them. There's one kid whose girl cousin moves to town. They form a close bond. There's a scene where they try to heal a wounded owl. And then another kid's parents are divorced, and he and his sister write to their mom. And uh, there's a really funny scene where... uh, Excuse me for a second. There's a scene where um, uh, Mr. Liu asks the students to bring a sp- like a piece of their poop to class. I'm not kidding. <laughs> a sample of their poop to class. And then, you know, what's also interesting is how this story also has examples of an- elements of environmental awareness and justice. That's something I was not expecting, but probably should have given the title. I was assuming that would be more speaking to the setting rather than the plot of the narrative. This film shows how on a small local level how we can care for the nature around us. Overall, it's a super heartwarming, lighthearted teacher movie with a sweet love story subplot that I highly recommend. I had a smile on my face the entire time throughout the movie. Green Green Grass of Home is available to watch on YouTube. Next up is is um film is an animated film called called um called Johnny Corncob and uh so uh this is the second animated movie I'm talking about the first one being Baby's Kids um so Johnny Corncob directed by Mark Sel Jankovic, it's Hungarian. This is based off of a Hungarian epic poem got by Janos Vitez by Sandor Petofi. The narrative follows the titular shepherd on his quest as a soldier to be united again with Alaska, the love of his life. It's a hero's journey arc reminiscent of the Odyssey. And similar to Marcel Jankovic's other film, Son of a White Mare, Johnny Corncob has beautifully inventive animation. It's truly transportive on a surrealist, psychedelic level. So it's a, a fair warning to those who are photosensitive. Uh, and, but, uh, yeah, it was ahead of its time for sure. And, uh, especially considering this was the first animated film in Hungary. Vibrantly enchanting with spiritual symbolism, Johnny Corncob is a hidden gem uh, of an epic sure to transport you to a fantastical world. Johnny Corncob is available to watch on Canopy and Mubi. Next up is Love and Other Catastrophes. And uh, this is... This is a... from 1996, it's Australian, direct, written and directed by Emma Kate Krogan, set over, set over the course of a day. The setting is the University of Melbourne. Mia, played by Frances O'Connor, and Alice, played by Alice Garner, are roommates who just got a new apartment, both concentrating in film studies. The two are trying to get another roommate. Mia's on and off girlfriend, Danny, played by Ronna Mitchell, is in town, making things a little complicated due to Mia's hesitancy towards commitment. <laughs> There's a great lecture scene, film class lecture scene, where a professor says that they're going to discuss the films of Alfred Hitchcock's, and then the students object. There's different camps of director fan groups who give their case, if you will, as far as which directors to get a taste of. One group is like, uh, sorry, one group, um, There's one group that says Quentin Tarantino and they're dressed like the gang in Reservoir Dogs. Another group says Woody Allen and, you know, they're dressed like, you know, characters in Woody Allen movies. 
another group praises Spike Lee and they're dressed in like 90s hip hop attire. Alice is late on her thesis on feminism in Doris Day movies. And she's sort of, she's in a relationship with a classics major who also happens to be a part-time male prostitute. And then unknowingly, a timid med student named Michael, Doug, uh, Michael Douglas, uh, played by Matt Day, is crushing on her. <laughs> Their relationship is cute. Obviously, he's not Michael Douglas, and they joke about that in the movie. It's like a Michael Bolton's in office space kind of situation. Yeah. I discovered this movie last year when Elric Kane brought it up on the VHS episode of the Pure Cinema podcast. Uh, like the video store episode and Brian Sauer and Elra Kane do this thing where they select five films because, and there's a great scene in this movie where they have a conversation about three films because yeah, overall it's a super sweet and charming feel good hangout movie. I just recently watched it again and it puts a smile on my face. Love and other catastrophes is available to watch on YouTube. Somebody needs to put this on Blu-ray, please. Anyway, Next up is Lunatics, A Love Story from 1991, directed by Josh Becker. Hank, played by Ted Raimi, is a frightened loner. He has not set foot out of his apartment for six months due to his irrationally extreme anxieties. That's where the surrealism kicks in. He didn't even attend one of his brother's weddings. His mother's like, why aren't you married? Your younger brothers are married. Hank does not want to form connections with people, but his fears get in the way. Hank then meets a woman named Nancy, played by Deborah Foreman. She has a boyfriend named Ray, played by Bruce Campbell. And uh, I, I forgot to mention, Josh, the director, Josh Becker, he went to school. He, he, Sam Raimi, Josh Becker, and, um, uh, and Bruce Campbell all went to high school together, so they know each other and are buddies. And, um, um, like, Josh Becker um, is a filmmaker... Two, just like Sam Raimi, he's he's to Sam Raimi what like what what Quentin Tarantino and Eli Roth are to, uh, 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 um, he's what um Robert like what Robert Rodriguez and Eli Roth are to Quentin Tarantino if that makes sense. Anyway, um, romance of course sparks between Hank and Nancy. Like Hank, Nancy has her anxieties too. She's under the belief that she curses everything she touches in her life. These feels are illustrated through these wonky, nonsensical, uh, cartoony set pieces. All of these are, all of which are super creative. Ted Raimi is perfect for his role because he balances kookiness and timidity. He and Deborah Foreman have adorable chemistry. Imagine Bo's Afraid, but more of a romantic comedy. Um, it's, that's like this movie. Um, this movie's a blast. It's the perfect blend of adorable sweetness and surrealistic absurdity. Lunatics A Love Story is available to watch on YouTube. Please, somebody put this out on Blu-ray! Next up, Scent of the Green Papaya from 1993. Uh, written and directed by Tran An Hung. Uh, this is a Vietnamese film. The story follows a peasant girl named Mui, it's spelled like M-U-I, played by Lu Man Son, working for a family in Saigon, Vietnam. It's a period piece today, starting in 1951. Family in Mui, the family Mui works for, works, uh, was wealthy at one point, but have descended towards poverty, resulting from the patriarch's adultery and living above the family's means with egregiously deficit spending. The wife essentially becomes the breadwinner as her small business becomes the financial source which is relied upon. The mother of the husband is a lonely widowed woman living a hermit-like lifestyle upstairs. She points her finger at her son's wife, stating that it is her fault that he has gone down the road he did. In other words... She says, she basically calls her a bad wife. The family has three sons. The oldest likes to hang out with his buddy, Kuyen. It's spelled like K-H-U-Y-E-N, whom Mui has a crush on, played by Huang Hua Hui. And I don't think neither of uh, Lee Man Song nor 
Wong Hua Hui really um uh broke broke like uh were any in any more movies after this, I don't think. But it's a shame because both give outstanding performances. The middle son has a habit of playing with bugs, and the youngest, who very much looks up to his father, is a troublemaker. Family had a daughter who sadly passed away, and the wife bonds with Mui, making her a surrogate daughter. Working for this family is an educational experience for her because she learns about society, human relationships, and interactions. And then, cut to ten years later, as the wife is now an empty nester, Mui becomes a servant for Ku Yin, the handsome friend of the older, the older son, who's now a pianist. They reconnect, Lu Man San and Wang Hua Hui uh, non-verbally communicate their passionate soul-level so, soul love so beautifully. And it's a testament to their performances and Tran An Hung's carefully precise direction. Thanks to the cinematography and production design, along with the amazing ambient sound work, this film is one heck of a sensory experience. The house which uh, she she works in is almost otherworldly with how vibrant the color the colors are, and that goes for the food for the costumes as well and the food. There's a lot of cooking in this movie, and it will for sure make you hungry. Um, Tran An Hung, his most his his recent film, I've been very much looking forward to seeing. The taste of things I heard makes you hungry when you watch it. And uh, there's a lot of cooking in this movie, and it will, as I said, for sure make you hungry. All in all. This is such a sweet and beautiful coming-of-age film. Big recommendation for me. It is definitely one of my favorite first-time watches of 2024 thus far. The Scent of the Green Papaya is available to rent for a few dollars on Prime, and it's available on Blu-ray. Um, uh, it should... I don't know what label, but it should definitely get another another release, Blu-ray release. This is, this is ripe for a Criterion release. Next up is we're going with a we're going back to a, down, back down under another Australian film Sweet Talker from 1991 directed by Michael Jenkins. Harry Reynolds played by Brian Brown, who actually co-wrote the script, is newly freed from prison. Once again, he joins his partners to come up with a new con. And they travel to Beachport, a decaying village on the Australian coast. There's a that Portuguese treasure ship is buried beneath the beach sand and the plan gets thwarted when he meets Julie played by Karen Allen the woman who runs the hotel and her son David they fall in love and he becomes a father figure to David it's just a sweet and charming romantic comedy perfect for the family think Crocodile Dundee meets like meets a classic 80s or 90s summer vacation comedy like Summer Rental or Captain Wrong Sweet Talker is available to watch on Peacock Amazon and Tubi and then finally, we're going to talk about Time After Time from 1979, directed by Nicholas Meyer. Um, Michael McDowell plays H.G. Wells. Note that this is not a biopic. He is used in a fictional scenario. The film is actually adapted from a sci-fi title of the same title by Carl Alexander. So H.G. Wells has created a time machine, and he plans to use it to travel in future's time to a utopian paradise. However, Jack the Ripper, played by Jack Warner, with the police on his back, steals H.G. Wells' time machine and travels to 1979. Malcolm McDowell's H.G. Wells tracks Jack the Ripper down to put a halt on his murderous escapade. In doing so, he meets a bank teller named Amy, played by the wonderful, Mary, lovely Mary Steenburgen. And they fall in love. And Malcolm McDowell and Mary Steenburgen were married for about a decade, I think, for like almost a decade, but then they inevitably got divorced, and now she's happily married to Ted Danson. Um, so, uh, yeah, they fall in love, and all three performances are fantastic. It's a fish-out-of-water hero's journey with a, mag with a magical feel throughout. On paper, this concept should not work. Such a premise could, premise 
could be executed so tastelessly and gratuitously. But I think that it's leveled by the action chase element and the dialogue being so surprisingly witty. Malcolm McDowell does provide seriousness to his version of H.G. Wells, but not to the extreme. In fact, there's sort of kooky aloofness he gives. I think because he's a man out of time, it's interesting. That's because he's a man out of time. That's like part of why that is. And it's interesting how the reverse situation occurs in Back to the Future 3. Mary Steenburgen plays Doc Brown's love interest. when he and Marty go to 1885. In that case, it was, uh, it was a man from the future meeting and fall in love with a woman from the past. This time, it's the other way around. It's amazing how this came out before the first Back to the Future movie was even released. I wonder if Robert Zemeckis saw this before he made Back to the Future trilogy. What well, it's super refreshing about this film is that Malcolm McDowell is actually a good guy. This is another hidden gem. If you have parents who grew up in the 70s, watch this or show this to them. They'll love it. Time After Time is available on Blu-ray. So that will do it for my Valentine recommendations video. Well, if you like this video, then click the like button and subscribe. The links to my socials are in the description below. Happy Valentine's Day. And this is being recorded on Super Bowl Sunday. So happy Super Bowl to, uh, to both rooters of both teams. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.